Well, I am a trained relativistic astrophysicist, and I got my PhDs always in physics departments working on astrophysics problems involving general relativity, gas dynamics, and so forth. And so in the 70s, when I was developing what is now called numerical general relativity, which is the way to solve Einstein's equations for dynamics of black holes, colliding black holes, or in astrophysics uh, that require general relativity, like supernova events and so on. Uh, I had uh, to go and get a top secret nuclear weapons clearance to get access to supercomputers, because in the mid-70s, uh, the only place to get a supercomputer was uh, either at Livermore, Los Alamos, or uh, in one area, which was weather. Now, astronomy has always been a driver of supercomputing. And in fact, uh, on Johnny von Neumann's computer that was built um, by the Institute, uh, half of that and went to Army, uh, to Aberdeen. Half of that was used, of course, for the Army for uh, trajectory uh, calculations. But the other half was used for stellar evolution. So astronomy and von Neumann's interest in weather meant that astronomy and weather for 50 years basically have been uh, dominant drivers of supercomputing usage. And yet, uh, to do pure astrophysics, you're having to get a top secret nuclear weapons clearance. Now, nobody seemed to think there was anything unusual about this. Um, and so I just went ahead as a postdoc, and I would get a few months in the summer, work 100 hours a week, and then the last of the year I'd have to live off. I'd go back to Harvard, where I was a junior fellow, try to explain to them about, you know, one could solve the laws of physics that we had been laying down for 300 years in incredible detail for engineering devices like nuclear weapons that put on Earth temperatures of the center of the sun, uh, stresses beyond anything that we could imagine in academic problems that we were trying to solve in lots of disciplines. So this thing could revolutionize academic research. Well, nobody got it. I mean, it was like, I really felt like I was transitioning in a flying saucer between this advanced civilization at Livermore and this Stone Age culture at Harvard. And Harvard was as advanced as any place in thinking about this. So it was a, what, I did not figure this out until it was in the early 80s. And by then, the first Cray had gone into the continent of Europe in an open scientific institute, the Max Planck Institute for Physics and Astrophysics. So I'm over there in the summer along with people like Dave Arnett, who is one of the great supernova super, uh, supercomputer guys in our country, and people in chemistry. And it was like Paris in the 20s with all these expatriates sitting over there. And, and we're like trying to figure this out. Like, this is an American-built supercomputer, right? Why are we in Munich? Right? I mean, this is very strange. So, <clears throat> but, you know, in America, we don't question the infrastructure somehow. I mean, it's just like it's either there or it isn't there, and that's just the way it is. But I was uh, having a Masa beer late one night. Actually, I think it was the second Masa beer with my German host, who had also been born like I was post-war. And he finally turns to me and he says, aren't you ashamed of yourself, you big, rich, occupying country? You come over here in our little country. And, and we finally get enough money scraped together after World War II to buy one of these supercomputers, and you Americans come over here and use up our time. I says, how did you guys ever win the war? You know, what, what is going on here? And, I, and so this finally sort of just stimulated me to saying, what is going on here? This is nuts. And I went back and I found out, for instance, that after the Sputnik program, the federal government had funded the universities, built the science buildings, started the supercomputer centers. IBM would go around and give away almost the mainframes. And, and so the scientists in the 60s took it for granted that they had the fastest computers in the world in academia. But about 1970, with the starting of the Vietnam War and with all kinds of guns and butters issues and everything else, that stopped. And in fact, to give you an example, by 78, half the number of PhDs in engineers in engineering was being generated in our country as there were in 1970. So there was this complete severing of the Sputnik era uh, partnership with the federal government, and it was particularly bad in computing. To give you an example, when I was at Livermore in, um, in the 70s, there were four CDC 7600s, which were just one of the finest supercomputers ever built. No American university ever took delivery of a single CDC 7600. 
In fact, the University of Illinois, when I first got here, had a Cyber 175, which was a retread, a second design manufacturing of, of this thing. And we were one of the first universities that had it, and people all thought that you know Illinois naturally was way ahead of everybody else. So it's like we were just completely divorced from the private sector that was generating these wonderful machines because of federal policy, which was to say these things are only are so valuable that we can only afford to put them into war environments. So after this German encounter, I. Um, came back and I said, well, gee, I wonder how many other scientists like me are there? So at the University of Illinois, I started call, cold calling my colleagues and saying, hi, you don't know me. I'm a little assistant professor, but I bet you that your research is blocked by lack of access to supercomputers. Uh, and they'd sort of say, like, huh, crack, crack, who is this? You know, <laughs> crank call. And But we'd start talking in chemistry and biology and agriculture and so on, and, and sure enough, it turns out that, that that was true. They knew how to do the science, they just didn't have access. So I said, well, send me a little prospectus of what science you could do if you had a supercomputer. Well, I ended up with 65 faculty in 15 departments on one campus. And I thought, this has got to be this way all over the country. So it was, I really started saying, well, gee, somebody's got to raise this issue. And about that time, there had been a lax report that had uh, the federal government had done to begin to undercover some of this stuff, but they still weren't. I remember Peter Lax. He was one of the greatest mathematicians, uh, head of the, one of the top people in the Cron Institute, a long time advocate of things computational. And I had this long, long battle with Peter because in the draft report of the Lax report, it was not. It was going to say, well, yeah, we got to get one of these supercomputers and make it available to the universities, but you know, let's put it at Livermore, put it somewhere that people know how to do this stuff. And a university was not on the list of what the LAX report considered to be appropriate sites for a supercomputer. So I had this long battle over the telephone, I remember, with Peter LAX. It was sort of David and Goliath, because I mean, he was this giant of the field, I'm nobody. And um, I, I finally convinced him not to exclude universities as a possibility, even though he felt that it was fairly unlikely that any of them would be able to play with sharp instruments and not hurt themselves. Um, so, I mean, you got to understand, the world was totally different when the Supercomputer Center's program was coming into being. And people, it's so hard for people now on the web and everything to go back to that time. There was no internet. You know, there was there was these wonderful people, Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn and all these people, Bill Joy, who had developed TCP/IP and 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 embodied it in the ARPANET. This was a few computer science departments and military. Okay, nobody in a physics department or chemistry department ever heard of the ARPANET, much less had any access to it. Uh, but it was obviously the right idea. And so once we got the Congress to put through money for a national supercomputer program, then there was a national competition and, and, and so on, and the five centers were selected. The first thing then that NSF realized, well, OK, now we put these in place to be providing access to academic scientists, and yet, uh, like, they have to fly to Champaign-Urbana like I had to fly to Livermore, OK? This isn't right. So there were a lot of discussions then, but the trouble was that the telecom lobbyist in Washington would block any discussion of the federal government putting in the kind of network we have today, which is what people wanted. I mean, everybody knew that they wanted to have a ubiquitous email, person-to-person -person network. But as soon as they'd start talking about that, the telecom lobbyists would come up and say, no way, guys, that's private sector. Don't get the federal government involved in that. Stay out of it. <clears throat> so what we learned early on is real interesting. It's like. If we had argued instead of the supercomputer program, let's get the federal government to buy everybody a personal computer, which was IBM personal computer was two years old in 1985, and put on people's desk, okay? Again, this would be an interference with the private sector. Um, so, but we said, oh, we'll just take a few of these esoteric supercomputers. And they said, okay, that's right. There's no market there. That's okay. The federal government has a role. Well, it was the same thing with networking. What we said is, we just want to put a high-speed backbone across the country to connect the five centers. 
And, and the telecom people said, okay, that's cool. You know, 56 kilobits was the national high-speed backbone, less than ISDN today. Um, yeah, that's not a market, okay? And, and we said, we got a few of these weird supercomputer types who are out in universities who want to hook into that. They say, yeah, that's okay. That's not a market. You can do that. Well, that was the NSF net backbone. Then the regionals got funded. And then the campuses were afraid that if they didn't dig up their quad and put in some fiber, then the professors who wanted to get access to supercomputers would go to a university that would do that. So gradually, the whole internet emerged out of uh, the, the, f the sort of policy vice you get into Washington where you can't do the right thing. You have to do something that seems irrelevant but has a logic to it that will gradually bring the market forces into play that will spin out ultimately a whole industry.